Ibrahim Traoré just pulled off a stunning move that left the world in awe. With nothing but precision, strategy, and a cutting-edge drone strike, his forces recaptured the heavily contested town of Jibo, once a terrorist stronghold. No boots on the ground, no warning, just a high-tech blow that sent insurgents flee. How did Traoré pull this off, and what does it mean for the future of warfare in Africa? Stay tuned. In late 2023, the city of Jibo in northern Burkina Faso was on the brink, a brutal two-year siege by the jihadist network G. IEM had turned the city into a prison for nearly 300,000 people. It was encircled, suffocated, and starved. Convoys were ambushed, roads were mined, and survival was a dirty struggle. To many, the fall of Jibo seemed inevitable, and yet, just months later, the siege was broken. The insurgency's momentum was stopped cold. So how did Burkina Faso's military pull off such a stunning turnaround against the threat that had stumped international forces for years? The answer wasn't a massive ground offensive or some new foreign intervention. The answer was in the sky. This is the story of how Captain Ibrahim Trowray's drone campaign retook Jibo. But this wasn't just about buying new tech, it was about a new, ruthless strategy that combined persistent surveillance with overwhelming firepower. This is how the Bayraktar TB2 and the more powerful Bayraktar Akanji were used to let a determined army dominate the battlefield. With and to break down the capabilities of these drones, dissect the strategy that turned real-time intelligence into a weapon, and explore the wider, and often troubling, implications of this new era of warfare in the Sahel. To really get what happened over Jibo, you have to understand the sheer desperation of the crisis. This wasn't a normal war. It was a siege meant to break a nation's will by making an example of one of its cities. The insurgents when trying to capture a military base, they were strangling 300,000 people. They controlled the roads, the farms, the very lifelines that kept people alive. The Burkinabi army was stuck, a relief column on the ground would be torn to shreds by IEDs and ambushes. But letting the city fall would have been a catastrophic defeat. For a moment, it seemed like there was no way out. But a fundamental shift was happening in the capital of Bagadougou, driven by new leadership and a new partnership with Turkey that would change everything. Jibo isn't just a pin on a map, it's a critical crossroads in northern Burkina Faso, a gateway between the country's center and the vast, ungoverned spaces of the Sahel. For years, this region has been the epicenter of a brutal insurgency, fueled by extremist groups like the Al-Qaeda-affiliated JNI. These groups are masters of asymmetric warfare and their strategy for Jibo was a brutal lesson in modern insurgency. First, and most important, was isolation. J.N. Liam's goal was to turn Jibo into an island. They didn't need a costly frontal assault, they just had to cut its arteries. They did this by denying all movement, through a relentless campaign of IEGs, hit and run ambushes on supply convoys and checkpoints, they made the roads to Jibo impassable. The city became a prison, with farming and trade cut off, food became scarce, prices shot up, and hunger was turned into a weapon. Second, the insurgents used the terrain to their advantage. The Sahel's defining feature is its vast emptiness. Fighters on motorcycles could scatter into small, mobile units, making them nearly impossible for a conventional army to track. They could swarm an isolated army post for a surprise attack then melt back into the landscape before air power could even arrive. There was no center of gravity to hit. Third, they waged a psychological war. The siege of Jibo was a message. The government can't protect you. Every failed convoy, every civilian killed foraging for food was a propaganda victory designed to crush morale and boost recruitment. They were selling a story of inevitable victory, and it was working. By early 2023, it was estimated that insurgents controlled huge swaths of Burkina Faso, and Jibo was the poster child for the government's retreat. The Burkina Bay military was trapped. Their armored vehicles were eyed magnets. Their infantry patrols were ambush bait. They were fighting blind. The problem wasn't a lack of courage. It was a mismatch between their tools and the enemy's strategy. A new tool, and a new doctrine, was desperately needed. The solution would come from thousands of feet in the air. The strategic pivot for Burkina Faso started with a political and military shift. Under Captain Ibrahim Traoré, who took power in September 2022, 
the country went on an aggressive military shopping spree. It moved away from its reliance on Western powers like France and forged new partnerships with countries like Turkey. This wasn't just about buying gear, it was about acquiring a specific, battle-proven capability that had already reshaped walls from Nagorno-Karabakh to Ukraine. The armed drone, the tools at the heart of this new strategy, were two different but complementary drones from the Turkish company Baykar, the Bayraktar TB2, and the Bayraktar Akanji, but calling them drones doesn't quite do them justice. They were the cornerstones of a new philosophy of air power, one perfectly suited to solve the problems the Burkinabi army faced. First, the workhorse, the Bayraktar TB2. It's a medium altitude, long endurance, male drone, famous for its reliability and effectiveness. Medium altitude means it flies high enough to be hard to spot, but its cameras can still see everything in detail. The real game changer, though, is long endurance. A TB2 can stay in the air for up to 27 hours. Think about what that means. A jet screams overhead for a few minutes. A helicopter is loud, vulnerable, and thirsty for fuel. But a TB2 can motor silently over a vast area for over a day. This transforms it from a simple strike weapon into a tool for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance ISR. For the first time, the Burkina Bay military could simply watch. They could track insurgents on motorcycles for hours, even days, mapping their safe houses and supply routes. The TB2's constant gaze stripped the insurgents of their greatest weapon, anonymity. And the TB2 isn't just an eye in the sky, it's a killer. It carries up to four laser-guided smart munitions, like the MAML. This is a lightweight, precise weapon perfect for hitting specific targets. A vehicle, a command post, a small group of fighters, without the massive collateral damage of a traditional airstrike. But the troll ray government didn't stop there. In April 2024, they unveiled a far more powerful platform, the Bayraktar Akanji, which means raider. If the TB2 is a scalpel, the Akanji is a sledgehammer. This is a high-altitude, long-endurance, HAO, combat drone, a whole different class of military hardware. The Akanji is bigger in every way. It has two turboprop engines, flies higher at 40,000 feet, and carries a massive payload of over 1,350 kilograms. This allows it to carry much heavier bombs, capable of destroying fortified compounds, large convoys, and major enemy concentrations. It also has a more advanced sensor suite, including radar that can see through clouds and at night. The genius of the strategy was networking these drones together. The TB2 served as the constant, unblinking eyes to find and fix the enemy. Once a high-value target was found, the TB2 could laze it with an invisible beam. Then, the heavily armed Akanji, circling miles above, could be called in to deliver a devastating precision strike. This created a seamless find, fix, finish, kill chain, combining the endurance of one platform with the lethal firepower of another. This was the doctrine that was about to be unleashed on the besiegers of Jibo. The operation to break the siege of Jibo wasn't one big battle. It was a methodical and brutal campaign that applied the new drone doctrine with ruthless efficiency. We can break it down into two main phases that show how the drones and ground forces work together. The first phase was quiet. Before any bombs fell, the military sent its fleet of Bayraktar TB2s to establish total aerial surveillance over the Jibo area. For weeks, these drones kept a near constant watch, flying in shifts to ensure 24-7's coverage. Their mission wasn't to attack, but to see, map, and understand. Drone operators, trained in Burkina Faso, began the painstaking work of pattern of life analysis. They weren't just looking for fighters, they were looking for the entire network that supported them. They tracked motorcycles and trucks from villages to hideouts. They noted where fuel and food were stored and where fighters gathered. The insurgents, used to operating freely, were suddenly living under a microscope. This had an immediate psychological impact. Fighters now had to assume they were being watched at all times, forcing them to scatter and hide. But the TB2s were patient. With up to 27 hours of order time, an operator could watch a single compound for a full day-night cycle, waiting for a sign of activity. All this information was fed into an intelligence hub, building a comprehensive picture of the battlefield around Jibo, target by target. With the battlefield mapped, the kinetic phase began. The hunter-killer teams of TB2s, and later, Akinsis were let loose. A TB2, 
Acting as the hunter, would track a target. If it was small and mobile, the TB2 could strike it directly with its own precision munitions. This was perfect against the insurgents' hit and run tactics. However, if the target was larger or more valuable, a command post, or a large gathering of fighters, the killer was called in. A TB2 would lock a laser onto the target, and a heavily armed Akanji would deliver a much larger bomb from high above. This let the military tailor its response to the target, maximizing lethality. This strategy came to a head in late 2023. In November, GN, IM massed a large force for what they hoped would be the final assault on the Jibo military base. In the past, this would have been a winning move. This time, it was a fatal mistake. Their movements were detected long before they reached the town, thanks to the constant TB2 surveillance. As the insurgents moved to attack, they were met not by surprise soldiers, but by a coordinated onslaught from the sky. The Burkina Faso Information Agency claimed that over 400 militants were killed as the drones broke the back of the assault. Drone footage reportedly showed the destruction of insurgent vehicles, including a captured armored MRAP, proving the TB2s could take out even hardened targets. This overwhelming and precise air power repulsed the attack and was a key turning point in definitively breaking the siege. The liberation of Jibo was more than a tactical win. It was a watershed moment for warfare in the Sahel. It showcased a new model of conflict with profound implications. First, it validated the idea of sovereign capability. Captain Troll Ray's government didn't just buy drones. It invested in training its own people to fly and maintain them. By establishing a drone training center, Burkina Faso took ownership of its new air force, a stark contrast to relying on foreign mercenaries. This self-reliant model is one that other nations on the continent are now trying to copy. Second, the operation showed the potent psychological impact of drone warfare. The government wasn't shy about publicizing its successes, releasing drone footage that quickly went viral. This boosted morale at home and acted as a powerful deterrent to its enemies. However, this new paradigm is full of risks. The most immediate is that the enemy adapts. Insurgent groups are not static. Across the Sahel, groups like GNIM are now using their own cheap, Commercial FPV drones modified to drop small explosives, while a TB2 can destroy a truck. A $500 drone can potentially disable a multi-million dollar armored vehicle. The skies over the Sahel are no longer a one-sided fight. Then there's the financial strain. Advanced drones like the Akanji and their munitions are incredibly expensive. For a country like Burkina Faso, sustaining a high-tech war is a huge economic burden forcing the government to introduce new taxes and nationalize key industries to pay for it all. Finally, and most troubling, is the ever-present risk to civilians. Precision weapons are accurate, but they don't eliminate the risk of error or bad intelligence. Human Rights Watch has accused the Burkinabi army of killing dozens of civilians in drone strikes since August 2023, including attacks on crowded markets and a funeral. Such incidents are not only tragic, but also risk becoming powerful recruiting tools for the very groups the government is trying to defeat, fueling the cycle of violence. The reconquest of Jibo is a powerful case study in modern warfare. It proved that the strategic use of drone technology, combining persistent surveillance with precise firepower, can break a brutal insurgency. The synergy between the Bayraktar TB2 and Akanji gave the Burkina Bay military a decisive edge. Captain Tro Ray's focus on developing a sovereign capability has fundamentally altered the security landscape of the Sahel. Yet, this victory isn't an end. It's the start of a new, more complex conflict. The strategy's success has sown the seeds of new dangers. The spread of cheap drones among insurgents, the immense cost of a high-tech war, and the profound moral risk of civilian casualties. The story of Jibo is a stark reminder that technology is a tool. Not a magic solution, drones can win baffles, but they can't build peace. The ultimate challenge will be to match this military strength with the political will and economic development needed to address the root causes of the conflict. The war in the sky has been won for now. The war on the ground, for the hearts and minds of the people, is far from over. If you found this analysis insightful, 